Welcome to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. You know, when you walk along this boardwalk, you're stepping back in time. Not just a few years, but centuries, because basically this is what Florida looked like long before man ever started tampering with the landscape. You know, there are bald cypress trees back here in the swamp that uh, were probably growing for a hundred years or so before Christopher Columbus was even born. We're going to take you on a video tour of the swamp, and we're going to stop frequently to focus on the animals and the plants and flowers and insects and just about everything there is to see here in the sanctuary. And the man who's going to help us and be our guide is the man who really uh, takes care of making sure that this place remains pristine. Hello, my name is Ed Carlson. I'm the manager of Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of this uh, magnificent place. The name comes from a freshwater river near here that was named the Corkscrew River back in the 1800s. Before there were any roads in this area, the pioneers used the Gulf of Mexico for their highway. And when they needed fresh water, they had to go up coastal rivers until the water turned from salt to fresh and refill their barrels. There's a river west of here that was so winding, it wound back and forth so much that they referred to it as the Corkscrew River. And this entire wetland system of Corkscrew Swamp is the headwater of that river. The river runs through downtown Bonita Springs today and has been renamed the Imperial River. Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is located in southwest Florida between the coastal community of Bonita Springs and the farming center of Immokalee. Located at the northern tip of the Big Cypress National Preserve, the sanctuary is easily accessible from Interstate Highway 75 by taking exit 111 and driving east on Immokalee Road. Within the sanctuary's nearly 11,000 acres is the country's largest remaining stand of virgin bald cypress, the oldest trees in the eastern United States. The sanctuary is also a place of refuge for a variety of wildlife, including some spectacular wading birds. Before we head out on the trail, a bit of history is in order. Audubon's role at Corkscrew Swamp started way back at the turn of the century. Back then, the plumes of wading birds were so valuable for women's hats that local people actually went into these remote swamps and shot the birds during the nesting season to take their plumes and send them to markets in the northern United States. The plume hunting was so complete that the birds were almost exterminated. The Audubon Society hired wardens to come and physically guard the wet nesting colonies here at the sanctuary over a period of several years and eventually passed laws to stop the plume hunting trade. So the Audubon Society was successful in preserving the large colonies of wading birds here at Corkscrew Swamp and other places in South Florida. The story continues. In the middle of this century, the value of the cypress timber itself became so great that it was feasible for logging companies to build railroads right into the heart of the bald cypress forest, cut the trees, haul them with steam-powered equipment to sawmills in northern Florida. The logging started in the southern Big Cypress, and it's just merely a coincidence that all of the stands of cypress in southern Big Cypress were cut, and Corkscrew Swamp was the last place slated for logging. By the early 1950s, the loggers had clear-cut all of the significant stands of cypress in this whole area, and they moved into the Corkscrew Strand. Now, with the long-term interest of Audubon and other conservationists, you can imagine what happened next. A coalition of conservation organizations and private individuals was formed, funds were raised, and the lands were bought outright from the loggers and other landholders. So today we have Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, which is unique in a couple of important ways. First of all, it's the last stand of old growth cypress forest left in South Florida. And it also still has the wading bird colonies here. It's a mystery why the birds prefer to nest here, but they do. And we still have nesting colonies of wood storks and all the other heron and egret, egret species that nest in, in Florida. We'll be seeing some of those birds momentarily. The visitor's first exposure to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is through the Blair Audubon Center, a modern educational facility which includes an art gallery, tea room, and the Swamp Theater. This is an impressive multimedia display which depicts the daily and seasonal changes in the swamp. As winter wears on, they drop low enough that fish become concentrated in isolation.
The center also includes a nature store filled with Audubon items as well as gifts for nature lovers and binoculars for the serious bird watcher. When it's time to head out into the sanctuary, visitors check in at the welcome desk where they'll be able to purchase a field guide and rent binoculars if desired. Our beautiful boardwalk begins right outside the Blair Audubon Center and it is completely handicapped accessible as are all of our facilities. Be advised the boardwalk is two and a quarter miles in length. That's a fair amount of walking, but you can proceed at your own pace and there are places to sit and rest and to take refuge from a passing rain shower. And all along the boardwalk are informational signs explaining the dynamics of the swamp's ecosystem. As we enter the sanctuary, the land is hardly swampy. This is pine land, typical in southern Florida. Here we find slash pines, saw palmettos, and several cabbage palms, an indication of richer soil than is commonly found in pine land. We also find grassland here with a variety of wildflowers, which change with the seasons. Be alert, while this is not the most active area of the sanctuary, resident and migrating birds can usually be found here. It's not unusual to find deer browsing among the trees. From the pine lands, the boardwalk moves into the wet prairie, another area where deer are often spotted foraging for food. There are also resident bears in the sanctuary. Our objective here at the sanctuary is to maintain a natural system where the forces of nature are in control. We don't feed the animals. We don't do anything to entice them in here. These animals seem tame because they're used to seeing people, but these are very wild animals, like these deer that you see here in the wet prairie. We don't feed any of the wildlife here. They make their own living. They're wild. They're on their own. They've never been molested or harmed. So they do tend to come right out in the open and allow you to see them. This is one of the greatest places in the world to tell the story of how important water is to these kinds of systems. Here you see an area we call the wet prairie, which is an area of marsh and grass. Over to the left is the pine flatwoods, which is the upland area, which is very rarely covered with water. And then over behind me to the right, you see the cypress forest. The cypress forest is really a river of trees. It's a broad, shallow river with trees growing in it all the way across. That's the deepest and wettest part of the system. Now, the area in between is too dry for cypress, too wet for pine trees. And occasionally, a fire, which is natural to the system, will sweep across the wet prairie and keep it open. The difference in elevation between the pinelands which is our uplands and the cypress forest, which is the wettest area, is two feet. So within a two foot elevation difference, you get the entire spectrum of native plant communities in this region. So you can see how important it is to maintain natural water levels. If we were to change those levels in any way, either drain the site or impound water and have artificially high water levels, everything would change. The system would not be as productive as it is. And you can see how crisp the edge is on that cypress forest and the pine forest, and how open and natural this prairie is. And we don't do anything to maintain this except occasional fire. Fire, usually started by lightning, is a naturally occurring event in and around the sanctuary. This means visitors will sometimes see the result, browned vegetation and charred trees. We should also mention that the boardwalk through the sanctuary is not just used by people. Black bears, Florida panthers, and bobcats have been seen here, as well as smaller animals. Don't worry, bears and panthers don't normally show up when there are lots of people around. Now the boardwalk leads into cypress and the deep forest beckons. Here on the very edge of the cypress forest, we encounter small trees that we call pond cypress. These trees have a light gray trunk and a very narrow leaf. And you, as you can see, a beautiful light green color here uh, when they first leaf out in the spring. These trees never grow to the size of the bald cypress. And there is a difference in between these trees on the edge of the forest and the larger bald cypress that we'll see later that grow in the interior in the deeper part of the swamp. It's a mystery exactly what the difference is between these trees, but they have a different growth form, different color, and a different leaf shape. 
In springtime, new growth abounds, especially on the cypress trees, which become lush and green. Just a few weeks earlier, the forest had a far different look. The bald cypress trees were, in fact, bald, a startling contrast to the greenery typical in Florida all year. The cypress is one of Florida's few deciduous trees, which lose their leaves in winter. It is somehow comforting to see the great forest burst into life in the springtime. Here we are in the heart of the old growth bald cypress forest. I'm six feet tall. These trees that surround me here are on the order of 500 years old, five to six feet in diameter, and 100 to 130 feet tall. Most people think of a swamp as kind of a stagnant and a foul place, but uh, here in the river of trees at Corkscrew, uh, the water's flowing, it's fresh. Uh, there are lots of flowering plants, very fragrant, very nice, nice place to be. It is a nature lover's delight. Move slowly and quietly and look around. The cypress trees are not alone. Their trunks and gnarled old limbs are host to a variety of other plant life, such as epiphytes. The air plants are not parasites and store water in dry periods and attract insects, tree frogs, and other life forms. The stiff-leafed wild pine with its red bloom stalk its blue flowers resemble orchids. Along the branches of the bald cypress grow mosses and resurrection ferns, one of many ferns to be found growing wild in the deep swamp. Another plant growing in pools of water resembles small banana trees. One of the unique species of plants out here in the deep cypress forest is the alligator flag. It has a broad leaf and resembles a close relative, a banana, and it's an indicator of the deepest and wettest areas of the forest. These are the deepest places where you're most likely to find alligators. That's where the name comes from. When you see these plants growing in a certain area, it's the most likely place to find an alligator in a pond. The plants go by other names as well. Fire flags, deer flags. A rustle in the vegetation. A limpkin comes into view. Florida is the only state which has limpkins in any number, and you may never see one outside this swamp. They are reclusive. This limpkin is most likely looking for apple snails, its primary food. A detour off the main boardwalk leads to an observation area, and yet another view of the sanctuary. From the observation tower in our central marsh, you can see the extent of this old growth cypress forest it's a horseshoe-shaped strand of trees that wraps around this central marshy area. And as I said, there's about 700 acres of old growth, which you can see from this area. And then this open marsh right in the center. And this is very similar to Everglades marsh habitat. A lot of sawgrass, native willow, red maples. Very beautiful open vista. The bursts of color provided by the red maples among the willows and sawgrass are a surprise to many corkscrew visitors. They consider it a northern tree, but the swamp maple is common in the wetlands of Florida. In midsummer, another explosion of color as wild hibiscus come into bloom. Back in the cypress stand, our sharp-eyed guide points out a nest that could easily be missed. The head that pops up is that of a white-eyed vireo, one of the many small birds that live in the swamp. There are also cardinals, Carolina wrens, tufted titmice, as well as migrating species, such as warblers, phoebes, and catbirds. One thing about the swamp, if you move along too rapidly, you'll miss a lot. Adopt a leisurely pace. There's no reason to rush. Watch for little movements in the greenery. You may be rewarded with a glimpse of a snake like this black racer or another small creature. There are 16 varieties of snakes that have been observed in the sanctuary.
Large wading birds such as the great egret are common in the water areas of the swamp as they search for fish and other food, often within a few feet of the boardwalk. There are several varieties of ferns in addition to the resurrection fern we've already seen. There are wild Boston ferns, which may be found in both sunny and deep shade areas, strap ferns, which don't look like ferns at all, and two larger varieties, the swamp and leather ferns. The latter may produce shoots 10 to 12 feet long. Continuing along the boardwalk, a strange sound comes through the trees. The sound can be identified when the North Lettuce Lake comes into view. It is springtime, and the trees around the lake are filled with squawking baby wood storks. Adult storks fly in bringing food. The chicks constantly vocalize their hunger. They grow even louder any time an adult flies over the tree. It's an exciting time for visitors, even though we sometimes must restrict entrance to the lettuce lake area so as not to disturb the nesting. Visitors might have to view the noisy activity from a slightly greater distance. Adult wood storks are often seen high above, riding the air currents or thermals. Are they trying to spot prey or just taking a break from the noise? Perhaps the latter, since they often fly many miles in search of a morsel for the young. What visitors need to understand is that they will not see large numbers of wood storks every spring. It all has to do with the water level. Water is the key to the preservation of this whole system. It's water that determines the distribution, the species composition, and the productivity of the native plant communities. And that's the base of the food chain. It also determines the productivity of your animal populations. And water is the key to supporting this entire system. And this is a rainfall-driven system. We don't have rivers bringing water here from great distances. We don't have springs that come up out of the ground here that bring us water. If it doesn't rain here, this whole system dries up. We have a wet season and we have a dry season. And it's the fluctuation of the water, the rain, that falls right in this corkscrew watershed that determines the health and drives this whole system. So we're very careful about protecting this area, making sure we have the historic water resources uh, that we've always had and that we're not influenced by drainage structures or other water use. And because of our protection efforts, Corkscrew Swamp today remains to be the least disturbed watershed left in South Florida. In the case of the wood storks, too much or too little water in the swamp may prevent the adults from nesting or cause them to abandon their nests and their young. There have been seasons when the water level has been just right and the adults have produced as many as 5,000 hatchlings. A year like that might be followed by three or four years in which very few wood storks were fledged. The nesting season lasts about four months. The young grow rapidly, soon testing their wings, awkwardly flapping from one branch to another, then flying from one tree to another. Within days, the young storks are flying all over the sanctuary, some even imitating adults by collecting twigs for nest building. With the start of the summer rainy season, all but a few of the wood storks will leave and fan out across Florida in the deep south. Even without the Woodstork show, there's always something to see in and around the lettuce lakes. Ibises, egrets, herons, and other birds are usually feeding.
These are called lettuce lakes because the surface of the water is usually covered with water lettuce. In wet times, there may be four feet of water beneath the lettuce blanket. When the swamp dries out in drought seasons, the lakes become refuges from wildlife from throughout the sanctuary. Occasionally, a visitor will see a small drama played out here. A pair of limpkins suddenly start chattering and acting strangely. The reason for the display becomes apparent as a large gator comes into view. The limpkins have a nest out of sight near the bottom of a small tree. There are recent hatchlings in there, so the adults put on an act to lure the gator away. One bird seems to be feigning an injury. Through it all, a small blue heron continues feeding nearby, only occasionally checking the location of the gator. For the limpkins, the act worked, and the nest is safe, this time. Days later, a new threat. Three chicks have been observed in the nest, and a large barred owl has taken up surveillance. A day or two later, the owl made a meal of one of those chicks. The surviving chicks are moved to a new nest, where the adults bring them meals of apple snails. Suddenly, the chicks leave the nest and come into the open, walking on the lettuce leaves. Obviously, the gators and owls are elsewhere. In addition to alligators, there are several varieties of turtles in the sanctuary, and on occasion, an otter might be seen in the lettuce lakes. We should mention that the Audubon Society maintains Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in a completely natural state. Among other things, that means fallen trees are not removed. The cypress logs provide places for plants to grow. The decaying process adds to the richness of the swamp and keeps a natural cycle unbroken. Many cypress logs are hollow. By the time cypress trees reach the ripe old age of 500 or 600 years, they have usually become hollow. They remain alive, but can be toppled in a strong wind. Speaking of strong winds, visitors might notice that many old cypress trees deep in the swamp are missing their tops. They were lost to Hurricane Donna, which swept through Corkscrew in 1960. While Corkscrew seems insulated from all but naturally occurring events, such as hurricanes, developments outside the boundaries are always of concern. First of all, this is the fastest growing region in North America, Naples, Fort Myers. We're getting tremendous population growth here and lots of residential development. And that requires drainage and it requires well fields for domestic water. It's also an area of explosive agricultural development, orange groves and winter vegetable farming. It's a very big industry in this area, so there's a lot of competition for water, and we spend most of our time trying to work with the permitting agencies like the South Florida Water Management District and the local growers and developers to make sure that their water use is not having a negative impact on the sanctuary, and we've been successful so far in that effort. Two more points of interest regarding the big cypress trees. Many seem to have roots growing on their trunks. These are the roots of the strangler figs, which start growing as air plants, then start sending the roots down to the ground where they take hold. In more tropical zones, the strangler figs become so large that they kill the host tree. That rarely happens here. Then there are those strange cypress knees, conical bark-covered projections growing up through the water from submerged roots. Naturalists don't agree on their purpose. They could be breathing devices for trees that stand in water, support structures, or pegs securing one root system to another. Or they could simply be one of those oddities that raise questions for which there are no answers. Throughout the sanctuary, the bark of many trees seems to have a blotchy appearance. It is not paint. 
These are lichens, a strange plant composed of alga and fungus which can vary in color from white to green to pink. These growths do the trees no harm. Along the final section of the boardwalk we see that an apple snail is inched out of the water and is laying eggs on the trunk of a small tree. The eggs must remain above water until the embryos hatch. The egg masses can be seen from March to September clinging to all sorts of plants. As we've already seen, the apple snail is an important food source for limpkins and the main food source of the rare Everglades kite elsewhere in Florida. High water levels can wipe out the snail eggs, greatly reducing food supplies for a number of species. A small alligator is seen with an apple snail in his mouth. He doesn't seem to know what to do with it, how to crack it open. Near the end of the boardwalk, immature white ibises are seen in the trees and water foraging for food. One of the best times to visit the sanctuary is in the early morning, especially in summertime. The swamp is cool, wildlife is on the move, and the typical afternoon showers are hours away. Remember to take your time and move quietly. Stop often to watch for small movements that give away the location of skinks and small birds. Listen for the bird calls. You might come across a red-shouldered hawk watching for prey. Or a pair of male red-bellied woodpeckers cavorting around a tree trunk. The Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is a place for patience. The more the visitor exhibits, the more he or she is likely to see. Back at the Audubon Center, visitors may notice a screened area to the left of the entrance and just outside the restrooms. This is part of our living machine sewage system. Without this system, modeled after the ecology of the swamp, we wouldn't have been able to build our Blair Audubon Center. Every visitor to Corkscrew Swamp sees something unique. The old growth cypress forest, there's nothing else like it anywhere. And we work very hard to maintain the pristine quality of this forest. When you walk the boardwalk at Corkscrew and go through that cypress forest, you're seeing a habitat that was here during the age of the dinosaurs, often described as being a million years from Miami. We hope you've enjoyed this video visit to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, a living example of what much of Florida used to be. But a video can go just so far. It can't bring you many of the sensory delights of the swamp. The smell of the trees and flowers, or the chill one gets when spotting a barred owl for the first time, or the serenity one feels sitting on a bench deep in the sanctuary, where the sounds of civilization usually don't penetrate. For the full experience, you'll just have to visit Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary in person. <laughs>